Hello and welcome to a special Jefferson Educational Society virtual event, Empowering Erie, Building Bridges for Child Care Solutions. I'm Ben Spagan. I'm the Vice President of the JES. Uh, this event is part of the JES's Ramey Fellowship Program, an additional optional track for the JES's Civic Leadership Academy, designed to offer an enhanced opportunity to participants to hone leadership skills and complete individualized guided research on critical issues facing the region, the state, and or the nation. Before I introduce the director of the Ramey Fellowship Program, uh, who will introduce our presenting Ramey Fellow, I will run through some housekeeping. Uh, we are hosting this event both uh, via Zoom webinar and are also live streaming on the JES Facebook page. If you're attending via Zoom, please feel free to interact with us using the Q&A function. Uh, as following uh, the presentation, we will be taking questions from you, the viewers. If you're tuning in via Facebook, leave your questions and comments in the comments section of this post. We will work to work our way through as many questions as we can following the presentation. Now, if you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this program, still send us your questions, your comments to keep this conversation going, either on the JES's Facebook page or its YouTube channel. And of course, for more information about upcoming JES programs and publications and the Civic Leadership Academy and Ramey Fellowship Program, visit www.jeserie.org and be sure to like us on Facebook, connect with us on LinkedIn, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. <coughs> And to introduce our Ramey Fellow, I would like to first introduce my JES colleague, Dr. Andrew Roth. Some of you might know Dr. Roth as a JES scholar in residence uh, from the numerous lectures uh, he's delivered at the JES, many rooted in exploring his American Tapestry project, uh, which is also a podcast on WQLN Public Media, NPR. Um, or you might know him from his some 160 installments and counting of book notes, which he authors weekly for the JES or as a member of our board of trustees, or as the interim director of the Brock Institute, or from his decades in higher education, from lecturing to leading, as he served as president of not one, but two universities. Or in here, you might know him as the director of the Ramey Fellowship Program. Um, he is, of course, all of those things, and we are grateful to have him here guiding scholars through a learning opportunity and a research project. Uh, we are here to discuss that project with one of our Ramey Fellows, so I'm going to turn things over to our Director of the Ramey Fellowship Program, Dr. Andrew Roth. Thank you, Ben, uh, and welcome to those of you joining us this afternoon as we experiment with uh, doing a live stream presentation uh, at lunch, so it'll be interesting to see uh, the response that we get. As, as Ben said, this is a presentation related to the Ramey Fellows. The Ramey Fellows is a program at the Jefferson Educational Society uh, supported through the generosity of Bruce Ramey, uh, one of the founding board members. The Ramey Fellows consists really of two parts. And I'm gonna go over this rather quickly. Uh, one part is a highly condensed mini seminar of leadership theory, kind of uh, taking a graduate 501 course an introduction to leadership in a graduate program and seeing if you can compress it into about uh, six hours. That's an interesting part of the program, but perhaps the least important and the least interesting. The more interesting part is that Ramey Fellows do uh, independent research. And over the years, we've had a number of people do high quality research. And I'm, I'm certain that this afternoon, we're going to hear another example of that kind of high quality research. Uh, previous programs explored uh, developing a minimal basic income program in Erie, uh, the future of high-speed rail transportation. Some years ago, uh, two Ramey fellows, one of whom used the, his his paper as a entree into law school, uh, collaborated on developing the concept of a minority business incubator in Erie, which idea is still being considered by some of the folks uh, involved in the East Side Renaissance on Parade Street. Uh, and there have been a number of others, uh, another number of other programs over the years. Today, uh, building on the work of the Jefferson Civic Leadership Academy's class of 2023 on the need for enhanced child care opportunities in Erie, a member of that class, Tamara Fami, is going to do a presentation, as you see, Building Bridges for Child Care Solutions in Erie. And one of the interesting aspects of it is Tamara is going to make the case that is sometimes missed by our political leaders, uh, that childcare and other 
soft issues are also economic development issues. When people hear the phrase economic development, they tend to think roads, bridges, uh, shovel-ready sites that have been cleared of all previous buildings, et cetera, that are ready for someone to build a new. But in other words, they think of hard material things and they don't necessarily think of the softer, softer only in the sense that it's not steel and uh, bricks and mortar, but uh, the need, for example, of a high quality workforce and childcare or reasonably priced, easily accessible quality childcare is in fact an economic driver because it will increase the it will increase the number of members of the workforce or make it easier or more convenient and that for people to actually pursue a career and become involved in the economy of Erie while at the same time being responsible parents. Uh, Tamar is a graduate of Slippery Rock University. He's originally from Pittsburgh, but after he graduated from Slippery Rock University, he relocated to Erie. At Slippery Rock, he, started, he studied computer science and management information systems and currently works in the IT department at Erie Insurance. He also has a small business that he runs on, the, on his own, and he's deeply committed to the success of Erie and has actually become a regular at the Jefferson as he's become involved in more and more, uh, more, and more Jefferson programs. And so with that introduction uh, to the topic, I'm going to turn the screen over to Tamar, who, and this is the way we're going to do this, Tamar will do his presentation, which I think runs roughly 30 minutes or so, depending upon, and then we'll do a Q&A. If you have questions, as Ben said, we're both monitoring two different venues, so it will try to interject those questions. Uh, and if not, we'll come back for a Q&A at the end. So Tamar? The All right, thank you, yours. Dr. I have to say the stage is yours, the screen is yours. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Roth, for the great intro introduction. And then thank you, Ben, as well, for putting this all together. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to my community conversation around empowering Erie to find a solution for our current child care crisis. Um, so doc as Dr. Roth had mentioned, uh, my name is Tamara Fahmy. Um, I work as an IT administrator at Erie Insurance currently. And after going to Slippery Rock, I moved to Erie and realized the potential that Erie has. Um, now, I first learned about the crisis of childcare through the Jefferson Civic Leadership Academy, and we were tasked to solve the childcare crisis. So after learning so much, I decided I wanted to continue that research for my Ramey Fellowship. So this presentation is planning to address the complexity and the challenges of childcare in Erie County, and really aiming to focus on the impact on economic and community development. So childcare is obviously a critical factory, factor that influences workforce engagement and community vibrancy. And with limited federal intervention, local level exploration is very important. So this presentation draws inspiration from successful interventions in other areas in hopes of finding a scalable and modelable solution that aligns with Erie's unique circumstances. So childcare impacts both individual families and the collective growth of the region and really shapes economic and community trajectory. So my research is exploring how accessibility and cost challenges in childcare and how they contribute to broader economic decisions in both the workforce and then influence for community development. So as part of the JCLA, we learned about childcare and really had to identify some key terms that were related to our research and we also had to answer a few questions. What is considered infrastructure? How do we develop a sustainable solution? How does interdependence affect potential solutions? So we did a lot of research. We visited with elected officials, asked questions, and we also drew upon personal experiences to get to the bottom of the crisis. So our findings were a simple yet complex dynamic. The child care crisis is characterized by these three interconnected pillars that you see on the screen, and they all affect each other. So first, there's an issue of supply and demand. A shortage of child care workers leads to an imbalance, and with the demand for child care services exceeding the available supply means that scarcity drives up costs, and these providers must compensate for that limited workforce. So second, retention is also a huge factor that, and a challenge within the childcare sector. 
High turnover rates among child care workers not only disrupt the continuity of care for children, but also impose financial build burdens on the child care facilities. And it's more expensive to recruit, more expensive to train. It's also more expensive to onboard new employees rather than retaining existing employees. So this perpetuates the shortage issues and drives up costs further. And lastly, the cost of child care itself just compounds the issue. Families are burdened with increasingly unaffordable child care expenses, which really constrain the household budget. The high cost of child care is both a symptom of the supply and demand imbalance and, you know, contributing to the factor of, um, you know, retaining skilled workers in that industry. So these three pillars that you see, you know, supply and demand, retention and cost, they're all intricately linked. And it creates a cycle of challenges within the child care system. Addressing one without considering its interdependence with the other is really likely to unlikely to yield a sustainable solution. So in the short term, focusing on workforce engagement and community development efforts are very important. Um, these initiatives directly impact some of those long term outcomes that you see on the screen, such as workforce pro productivity, educational disparities, community dynamics and Investing in workforce engagement strategies, such as improving working conditions and providing support for child care workers, we can really enhance productivity and job satisfaction for those child care workers. This, in turn, would contribute to better outcomes for both the children, families, and the staff. So in addition, supporting community development initiatives, such as creating networks for um, support of families, expanding access to quality child care services, it really lays the groundwork for addressing those educational disparities and strength, strengthening our community as a whole on the long, in the long run. So when families have access to affordable and high quality child care options, children are obviously better positioned for academic success and that results in the community is thriving. So child care is, an ex is essential for economic development yet the United States really lacks significant public investment in early child care, education, and child care, uh, which place, places a significant burden on both working parents and hurts productivity. So professional planners can and have bridged the gap between child care and economic development by understanding the complexities and collaborating with different experts to see how that affects the economy. So a recent PAS memo actually indicated that integrating childcare into economic strategies is actually essential for fostering inclusive and sustainable development. So one thing that I've learned through my research is that childcare is infrastructure and there's a difference between soft and hard infrastructure and really it presents the chicken versus the egg scenario. Having roads and bridges are important but the first step is having people to use them. So Erie's also been touted as a great place to raise a family. The barrier to, to, to a trained and ready workforce is childcare. A focus on soft infrastructure like this can really help relocating businesses and relocating families and attract them to the area. So workers' choices are directly linked to childcare accessibility, which significantly impacts Erie's economic trajectory. And with the majority of the employers re returning employees to the office, that also creates a strain on families that otherwise can't find or sometimes afford childcare. And creating communities encourages economic growth by attracting new individuals to the area. Uh, retaining the city's current population is also very important and access to childcare is very important for those people. So let's talk a little bit about precedence for local intervention. So Erie County's historical budget has definitely prioritized human services, which shows that the county's committed to addressing societal needs. As you can see, we've spent quite a bit of money on drug and alcohol abuse prevention, child welfare through the Office of Children and Youth, and then also mental health support. So really this is a reactive approach and I'm suggesting a proactive approach to addressing the childcare crisis rather than some of the therapeutic solutions that we currently see. By adjusting our approach just a little bit, we can really enhance the human capital, which is necessary for economic growth 
and could also possibly reduce the needs for some of the funds you see here on the screen. Let's talk about some private business investment in intervention. So Erie Insurance is $5 million investment in the EDDC or the Erie Downtown Development Corporation really serves as, as a successful model for private sector intervention. And it shows the potential of corporate involvement in community development. As one of Erie's major employers, there are opportunities to provide employees access to affordable childcare, which also can alleviate some of the stress on the facilities that are open to the public. So in addition to that, Gannon University's role in Our West Bayfront really illustrates the positive impact of nonprofit contributions to community development. Um, Gannon also supported the formation of the EDDC by donating $2.5 million, which ultimately led to UPMC Hammett matching that donation. So we have several models for success, which means that Erie does not have to reinvent the wheel. So this presentation is drawing inspiration from some of these successful interventions in other areas and really seeking a scalable and modelable solution that aligns with Erie's circumstances. So in assessing some of these other local interventions, um, the two that came to mind were the Allegheny County Child Care Matters Program, which is a great model within Pennsylvania. And then in addition to that, New York State's Child Care Assistance Program, which is widely considered a success story and provides financial assistance to low and moderate income families for child care expenses. So over the past several years, Allegheny County has shown its commitment to the children and youth programs. Um, they actually created a Department of Children Initiatives, which has created other things such as the Child Care Matters Program. Now this model is bringing in components of the statewide Child Care Works Program, but expands some of the eligibility. So the Allegheny Child Care Matters Program actually started initially with a $5 million budget, which was allocated from ARPA funding. And it was actually recently expanded, allocating an additional 500,000 in addition uh, to that initial investment. So their current administration and how they oversee the funds is they actually use um, the ELRC Region 5, which is the Early Learning Resource Center for that area. And they're responsible for distributing funds using their existing infrastructure. So there's no additional overhead. So families also benefit from a streamlined one door approach because they are already receiving assistance potentially from the ELRC and it eliminates the need to navigate through various different agencies and create confusion. So this simpl simplification really enhances accessibility and ensures a more straightforward process for all of the families that seek childcare services. So families that satisfy the eligibility criteria for the statewide child care works program, um, but have incomes that exceed 200% of the federal poverty income guidelines yet fall below that 300% um, are eligible to participate. So we expanded a lot of eligibility for different families in need within our within the county. So let's talk about some outcomes. Now, exact statistics haven't been released, but the ELRC Region 5 indicated that their Allegheny Child Care Matters program has helped over 350 families attend local early learning programs, and there's even a wait list. So this early data suggests the positive impact and accessibility uh, to learning opportunities within Allegheny County. So these initiatives, they enhance school readiness, improve academic performance, and really foster some crucial soft skills for the, some of these children as well. And promoting equal opportunity and addressing these disparities from the start, um, support for childhood education in Allegheny County lays the groundwork for a much more equitable community. Now there's no specific data available. Um, the concept of expanding the ranges of incomes that qualify for lower income families has the potential to release disposable income, which means there might be a positive economic impact. And reducing the financial burden of childcare, families might be able to redirect funds towards other local goods or local services and contributing to the local growth of their economy.
So improving child care accessibility and affordability, affordability directly impacts the state's economy. So enhanced employee retention and increased workforce participation can lead to higher state income tax re revenue. Higher child care enrollment directly boosts state income tax revenue. And lastly, reduced child care expenses increase consumer spending, which in addition to that drives up state tax revenue. So the Allegheny Child Care Matters program is considered a successful pilot with over 350 families helped and even more on the waiting list, which really led to that additional 500,000 in additional funding to help service those families that are on the wait list. New York State's Child Care Voucher Program, also known as the Child Care Assistance Program, is widely considered a success story and was actually launched in 1997. And the program provides financial assistance to low and moderate income families for child care systems or child care expenses, similar to uh, what you saw for Pennsylvania's Allegheny Child Care Matters Program. Now, the criteria for this um, is vouchers are awarded based on a family's income and their size just to ensure affordability for a wider range of families. So in 1997, they, the Department of Housing and Urban Development actually funded this initially with $42 million um, for the Family Economic Development and Supportive Services Program that includes child care services, youth leadership, and mentoring skills, and family and parental development counseling. So obviously implementing and managing a voucher program requires a very robust system and trained personnel. Uh, and currently the program's being administered by several local service districts and they're overseen by the New York State Office of Children and Family Services. Similar to PA, New York can definitely take advantage of some of the same benefits when it comes to state income and sales tax revenue. So let's talk about Erie County. Both examples that I just provided show a valuable model for Erie to consider when we're addressing our child care challenges. Challenges still exist, but the potential benefits for some of these children, families, and the local economy make it totally worthwhile. Adapting this program specific to Erie's needs could be a key step towards improving access to quality child care and really developing a stronger community. Once again, Erie can also take advantage of some of the same benefits that we saw from the other programs. This research shows that child care challenges in Erie are, you know, integral to economic and community development. And by learning from successful interventions, incorporating local influence, and encouraging collaboration between Erie's key stakeholders, which I'll talk about shortly, um, the study really aims to provide actionable recommendations for our area. Now, through scalable, modelable solutions, the goal is to create a strong community and drive sustainable economic growth. Now, let's talk about some of the challenges that we might face. One challenge is that our ELRC, or Early Learning Resource Center, is set up differently than Allegheny County. Our local ELRC, Region 1, services four different counties, which definitely strains resources and could potentially limit investment from local organizations that may not want to contribute to that larger footprint. So over the next few slides, I'll review some of the stakeholders that play a crucial role in child care solutions and talk about <clears throat> what we need to do for next steps. So first thing first, we need further advocacy, advocacy of child care crisis. Uh, we could de directly benefit from more people speaking up about these issues and having further investigation into our local considerations. We also need government support. So similar to Kate Phillips and Donna, Donna Cooper mentioned in their universal pre-K community conversation last week, is we need our local leaders and elected officials to be aware of this crisis and the importance to us, the people that they serve. As citizens, it's really on us to push for this change and we've got to make sure that our voices count and that our leaders understand why this matters so much. It's about setting all kids up for success early on, which really benefits all of us in the long run. 
Private businesses are also significant stakeholders in this conversation surrounding investment in childcare and early childhood education. So they understand that investing in early childhood education isn't just about social responsibility, but it's also a smart economic move. Ensuring that children have access to quality pre-K programs, businesses can actually cultivate a skilled workforce of their future. So nonprofit organizations also play a crucial role as stakeholders in this conversation surrounding education and early childhood care. With a mission centered around social welfare and community development, nonprofits understand the profound impact that early childhood education can have on the lives of both the children and their families. They recognize that access to quality care can level the playing field for some of these disadvantaged children. And nonprofits are often at the forefront of advocating for these policies that promote equity and access and education as they, they see firsthand some of the transformative power of early intervention. Now, in the event that one of these solutions I outlined does not succeed, we obviously must have a contingency plan. And one option is to engage with local businesses to explore private sector opportunities and really foster collaboration in addressing some of these childcare challenges. Another solution includes private employers subsidizing the cost of employees' childcare by matching government grants to each family, which we've seen happen in Kentucky. Lastly, partnerships with nonprofits. How can we collaborate with nonprofits like Gannon and UPMC and leverage their expertise around this issue? Overall, I think this is something that really can unite private businesses, nonprofits, and governments in Erie County. And there are various successful models that we can draw upon to develop a solution that's tailored to our community. By collaborating across sectors, we can leverage our collective resources, our expertise, and even insights to craft a comprehensive approach that ensures access to quality childcare and education for all children in Erie County. Together, we can create a solution that not only addresses immediate challenges, but also lays the groundwork for a brighter and more equitable future for generations to come. Lastly, I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Roth for spending so much time for me time with me, uh, refining my research, and uh, thanks again to the Jefferson Educational Society for making this all happen. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. That was very, uh, very thorough, very interesting. Um, as I begin to think about it, I'm looking to see if we have any questions. I don't have any yet. Uh, what would, from your perspective, what's the key takeaway you would want someone watching this program uh, what, what's the key takeaway you would want them to leave it, having um, either realized, learned, or heard? Well, one thing, Dr. Roth, is that childcare is infrastructure, and that's not something that I had considered. Um, when I thought about infrastructure originally, I know that we had had this conversation. You're thinking roads, bridges, and not necessarily addressing some of the issues around childcare and um you know, how we need to attract more people to the Erie area. And, you know, as Erie being such a great place to raise a family, child care is one of those um, critical needs. Yeah, one of your slides, you made a really important point uh, that I'm not even sure we've, we talked about uh, when we were prepping this, when you were doing the background work. And that is, is that affordable child care, reasonably affordable, easily accessed child care has both short-term immediate benefits to the individual in society, but it also has long-term benefits to the individual in society. In this case, the individual changes, it becomes the child uh, in society. Uh, the the short-term benefits are convenience to a parent, but that sometimes is poo-pooed by policymakers, uh, right. but the real short-term benefit is you increase the workforce and you increase the quality of the workforce by facilitating their ability to participate in it. You, I don't know if you or Ben want to elaborate on that. I see Ben has joined us again. Yeah, sure. I think one main thing that um, you know I was thinking about with community development and economic growth is really attracting the people um, to start businesses or bring their businesses here. Oftentimes, 
Um, when employers are looking to relocate, they're looking at some of these things that how sustainable is it to move to Erie, Pennsylvania? Am I going to be able to get a workforce um, that is able to, to live here and comfortably? Um, so that was one of the main, main things that I was focused on with community development and how important it is to have um, child care as that soft infrastructure that attracts new, new families and new businesses. I, I know in some previous Jefferson essays from some years ago on the uh, the new manufacturing, uh, by which I mean things like uh, 3D printing and computer assisted design, as opposed to smokestack manufacturing, uh, one of the big challenges was finding a workforce. And of course, as we created uh, Erie County Community College, the main rationale or the overpowering rationale for why that was a socially useful thing was to create a workforce. And I think actually, if you're going to put together a whole matrix of characteristics of Erie as a good place to start a business or a good place to relocate a business, a major impact has to be besides tax breaks, et cetera, et cetera, has to be a quality workforce. And this is an overlooked or maybe not overlooked not entirely un well understood um, issue. I, I totally agree, Dr. Roth. Not too many people consider that. Ben, do you have something to add? Well, it, so, <clears throat> so, so Tamara, please feel free to, to finish the thought there, but I, I had a follow-up question related to workforce. So um, I conclude thoughts there, and then I, I wanted to continue the workforce conversation for Erie County, Pennsylvania. Yeah, sure. Feel, feel free to go ahead and ask. Uh, sure. So, um, again, many thanks to this. And I think that Dr. Roth has um, an excellent point of the workforce attraction. Tamara, I, I was curious to, to wonder in, in the models that you were looking at, if you saw any sort of Im impact on the remote workforce. Um, and what I'm thinking about in, in, in asking that question or if you didn't see examples like how this might play into Erie's economy, because I, I can't help but think, you know, just uh, some some several days ago, the throngs of people that showed up to Erie to see the path of totality with the eclipse. And then, of course, all of the natural assets that, that Erie advertises for folks to come and visit. But we see states um, like uh, West Virginia with Ascend West Virginia as a work remote uh, offer, relocate to our city if you can work remotely, uh, any of the ones chosen, and there's an economic benefit to that. Uh, and, and of course, there are cities specific that have done that before, like a Burlington, Vermont, for instance. So, so I'm wondering in the quality of life bucket, you know, how this might also impact the idea that someone may not necessarily have a job in Erie, Pennsylvania, but they're living in Erie, Pennsylvania, because we can then broadcast out one of the quality of life things that we could offer a remote worker would be a better child care system or a better child care ecosystem that they would be attracted to relocate to our area. In addition to the many other no numerous reasons of four seasons, beautiful lakefront, cost of living, et cetera. Did you see that in the, the models that you looked at? Is anybody leaning into attracting a remote workforce uh, or did you come across anything that would suggest how that might impact that as Erie looks to build its economy? Yeah, great question, Ben. And, and really this is impacting both remote workers and in-person workers. Um, something that it, it had initially come across my, my plate was <clears throat> that remote workers might not need this, uh, might not need childcare because they work from home. And, and really, I think something that um, I found is these remote workers still need access to childcare, even people that I work with currently, because just because they're at home doesn't mean that, you know, they can both take care of their child and do their job to the fullest extent. So these workers definitely still need childcare infrastructure to do their job well. Um, so I would say that this impacts both remote workforce and the in-person workforce uh, alike. But with bringing people back to the office, um, that's definitely been a barrier for some families because they can't find affordable childcare. Or if they do find childcare, there's such a long wait list that they have to wait years to get um, their child to, to see that um, so really, I, I think that it affects both the, the remote workforce and in person. Hammer, yeah, I, I think, think that's an excellent point. Uh, so sorry to jump in, Andy, but I, I would just echo, we, we heard from uh, Richard Florida, renowned urbanist at the most recent global summit, um, you know, espousing work remote people work remotely 
They're not always at home. There are other places for them to be. They're working from coffee shops. They're working from co-working spaces. And in Erie, the city, the downtown, we're blessed to have a locally owned coffee shop, Ember and Forge, where many people are working. We have a co-working space, Radius Co-Work. So people aren't always working out of their house. They're working somewhere else. And so I, I think it's so important that you noted that because we want to break down any perception that just because you're in the home doesn't mean you're able to balance both things and be attentive to that if you're still doing your job and you're taking care of your child. And so child care is necessary for, for remote workers. Uh, we do right. have uh, two questions uh, coming in uh, on the webinar. And um, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and read the first one, um, which is a bit shorter, and then that'll allow me time to read the longer one uh, following up. The, the first one is, is, do you have plans to turn this research into action? Now, how can the community support any advocacy efforts. Tamara, we heard that as an important component of advocating for this in your presentation. So this person's asking, what are the next steps? How do we turn this research into action? How can communities support any advocacy efforts? Yeah, absolutely, Ben. And, and real quick, I'd just like to backpedal a little bit to address what you had said in addition to some of the remote workers that if they are at home and they're trying to look after their kids, who's suffering in that scenario? It's the child because the formative years of development are zero to three. And if you're having a child at home and not necessarily around other kids to develop soft skills or even around a qualified professional to teach your child um, things that your child's actually suffering in that scenario. So I just wanted to make that quick point before moving on to that question. Um, and that's also a fantastic point as well. Um, how can we turn this research into action? Uh, so I've been currently working with Dr. Roth to uh, write a policy paper that outlines some of the things that I presented today. Um, in addition to that, I've been working with some local um, leaders as well uh, and research teams. So Court Gold is actually um, heading an effort that him and I are going to be working together over the next <clears throat> several weeks to, um, you know, address what I've put together with my policy paper and see how it can be incorporated into their larger research project. Um, in addition to that, I have plans to speak with Elena Como. Um, to, to tell her about what, what I found and see how we can make something that's actionable. So I appreciate that, Tamara, and I, I think that that's, um, you know, such a good note. Uh, the early, uh, early uh, child care investment policy initiative that the JES is uh, currently um, uh, working with Court Gold on, as you mentioned, a policy expert, and has assembled a team of uh, some half dozen other policy experts operating in the field. Um, you know, to be able to address that for which we um, have a dedicated space on the JES website where folks can find information about that at jeserie.org. And of course, Tamara, your presentation is going to be there as well. Um, I did want to mention, uh, and this is the benefit of doing programming live, I've just gotten a note from one of our viewers saying there is yet another uh, co-working space option in, in the Erie neck of the woods. Uh, AE Hub, uh, so something uh, AE uh, entre uh, Achievers Entrepreneurial Hub, another co-working space. So Erie is blessed to have not one but two. Uh, Tamara, the other question that we have, folks, um, uh, they're, they're curious after your presentation is, is building on the successful collaboration models that you researched, uh, that one from Allegheny County and that one from New York State, uh, have there been any documented examples where government agencies, early child care centers, private and public organizations, and school districts have worked together to create a comprehensive early childhood education system? If so, what specific aspects of these collaborations led to positive outcomes for children and family? Yeah, that's a good question and not something that I necessarily encountered in my research. Um, however, I think it's important to note that the early childhood uh, learning or the early learning resource centers, as well as um, the Department of Children's Initiatives in Allegheny County, did form that collaboration to work together and figure out a solution. Um, now, this that pilot actually is also being tried in um, York County. So I was hopefully, uh, or I'm hoping that we also see some results from that pilot program and uh, can apply something similar to Erie. I think that was one of the big takeaways for me, Tamara, is that um, it, one, Erie doesn't have to go this alone. There are examples out there. You mentioned the two that you focused on in your research and the, the JES, the Civic Leadership Academy, had mentioned the model in Kentucky. Uh, that was observable as well. And I think that was important for you to note is to model and scale, you know, find ways that this can work for Erie. It's not as if we're 
copying and pasting, but we can adapt because I know one of the challenges that you had mentioned uh, was that um, ELRC, uh, our footprint is just simply larger. And, and we see that in, in other spaces. I, I'm thinking of the Ben Franklin Technology uh, Network. Uh, our swath of land is, is quite large because not as many people might live in that region compared to a Pittsburgh with Allegheny County or the greater Philadelphia metro region. Um, so scalable models, you know, so so important for that. Dr. Roth, I, I want to turn things back to you for any further questions that you might have at the moment while I check back in on audience questions. Okay, well, I want to pick up on those two questions. And then I had some others I wanted to ask Tamar about. Um, as, as I think about the one question about advocacy, in many ways, advocacy, I think, jumps to the top of the list here. Um, the second question, which was a, a complex question and a very vital one, is there are there existing models? And as Tamar has pointed out, there are some there are existing models. I don't know that we found one or that Tamar, I should use the singular here because Tamar did the work. Um, I don't know if there is one public private model that we found where there was government funding and private industry or private business, I shouldn't say industry. But I think before you get to that, the question about advocacy is really important. The more I think about this, and I know the JCL leadership class this year worked on it, and of course, Court Gould working in a parallel universe, and we wanna support his work, not get in the way of it, but actually contribute to it in some way. I think one of the issues that hasn't been uh, completely explored is advocating at a at probably a fairly high level of generality, just simply advocating for the critical importance of childcare. It seems to be something in our culture that by default is sent back to the parents or, and or sent to the schools. And it's not thought of as something that needs to be organized or systematically approached. And um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sufficiently well-informed enough to talk about it at any length, but other than to make the observation that forgetting for the moment about who pays for it, there is an ongoing and it is now decades old issue about the uneven quality of childcare centers and childcare facilities and the ability to act. And, and I'm not throwing any stones at anyone. I'm just making a general statement. Everybody knows that's true, that daycare facilities range from the very, very, very good to not so good. And so, and I think the reason we get that spread is, is that we as a society or a community haven't grasped one of uh, Tamar's earliest observations is as a child care is in fact economic development, but it's more than that. I, I don't want to go back through all of your slides and I'm looking at the clock. We're 45 minutes into this, which is fine. Um, but the earlier slide you pointed out that and this is an argument that has been argued in our society literally for decades with Head Start programs and everything else pre-K. Um, and the data, uh, and there is a, there is a rich uh, trove of data that demonstrates that these programs, quality versions of these programs actually work. The short-term benefit that makes childcare an economic development thing is it frees up and makes more uh, high quality employees available. There's an equity and inclusion aspect to it, but it's also actually a very thorough middle-class challenge. As a, and in fact, the challenge is probably equally difficult, although different in nature uh, for middle-class professional families as it is for a single parent, uh, perhaps without their economic resources. So there, this is a, an issue that can be easily stereotyped as uh, as only benefiting a certain segment of society when in fact it goes across. Uh, in fact, it actually even impacts high income families. So that's one thing there. It, it across the economic uh, landscape of access to quality affordable childcare creates a more inclusive, but also a higher quality workforce. But the second thing that Tamar mentioned is sometimes mis not noted that access to high quality child care also has educational benefits to the child, which has long-term benefits to the society. And so, you know, in, in our particular culture, 
uh, in which neoliberal uh, or neoconservative economic thought has dominated for the last couple of decades, one of the key pieces of that is human capital, which interestingly enough is again an across the board issue that one of the most vital things that you can have in any society or in any instance is what's known as human capital, and that is the quality of the workforce. And so quality childcare advocating for it at this stage has immediate short-term benefits, uh, economic benefits, because of making the parents in this instance, uh, giving them more ready access to the, mar the labor marketplace, but it also has long-term benefits because you are now uh, raising the next generation of, of quality workers. So I think uh, the question asked on advocacy is a really important one because at a, at a fairly high level of generality, this case has to be made that this isn't a kind of nice to do thing or this isn't a thing that will just make life simpler or easier for a certain set of people. No, this is actually a mission critical essential piece of building a stable society. And that hasn't actually, I don't think, been made. And so I think one of the things to think about, uh, Tamara, for you to think about in the future, and Ben, maybe for the Jefferson, although the Jefferson's already doing it, but it's doing it at a program. Uh, you know, I think we've already gone into the weeds. I've been reading court stuff, and I, I don't mean that. And I think actually to, to get political support for this, you got to go to the higher level. That case still needs to be made. And that is a, a higher level of generality. I mean, I think that's really a, an important takeaway. The second yeah. one on models, I think Tamara is better uh, equipped than, uh, than you and I have been to say this, but there are models that exist. And of course, the challenge always becomes in any instance, where's the money going to come from? Right. You know, who's going to advocate for it and who's going to pay for this? Uh, and this is one that is ripe for a public-private three or four-cornered solution. Uh, that yes, there is an opportunity here for uh, businesses, for-profit businesses, not-for-profit institutions. Uh, successful not-for-profit institutions don't mean they run deficits. It means they generate surpluses. Uh, therefore, they do have access to resources. And it's also for the individual. And so, and perhaps even uh, found it the foundation community uh, to get behind so that you'd end up with a four cornered thing where the individual, uh, the foundation perhaps acting uh, as, a, as a neutral third party here representing society as a whole, government, whatever the relevant governmental entity would be, and private employers putting together some kind of program that people have access to uh, getting funding that would enable them to purchase quality child care. I think, Tamara, you correct me if I'm wrong. The programs that seem to work best, New York State, and we I do know there are some private employers in Erie who do this, who perhaps at this point wouldn't want to be identified. But um, the successful programs work as voucher programs. It, it, you're not talking, when I say you, I mean actually specifically you, Tamara, you're not advocating that Erie County go necessarily into the child care business or that any given employer necessarily go into the child care business, but that they somehow figure out a collaborative mechanism to help people afford it, which is to say they would fund it in some manner, shape, or form. Absolutely, yeah. And there's a lot of opportunities to subsidize child care. Um, and, and even at the county level, I think of different um, ways we could fund it through the American Rescue Plan funding that um, Erie County's received. And maybe there's an opportunity to um, have a collaboration between all of those four counties that we saw on the screen that's, that are local ELRC services and providing some of the um, subsidized costs for these families. And, and one thing I wanted to add, Dr. Roth, in terms of advocacy is, um, you know, I always like to ask people, who do you know in your personal life that is having trouble finding child care, is having trouble paying for child care, and most people can identify at least one family or one person. And I think what that speaks to is the general consensus that childcare is a problem. But I think what you had mentioned is very important. 
It's how do we get the key decision makers and the key stakeholders to be aware of this problem and how do we get them to take action? Yeah. And I think that's probably what the person who asked about advocacy was also thinking. How, how do we get this in front of them and how do we get them to recognize it? Uh, a question that I had um, would be, and I think I might look into it this afternoon, uh, is there any research been done? And this is you know, beyond the scope of what you were um, looking at, and it might even be beyond the scope of what Court Gold is looking at, but they may actually have access to some data where anyone has where any governmental and two two part question and hopefully it's not an unfair one um, <laughs> is there any governmental entity well I guess there is both Pittsburgh Allegheny County and New York State would be it there were governmental entities that have apparently recognized the value of child care in terms of economic development although I'm not now that I hear myself say that out loud I'm not sure in either of those instances that might have been what their motivation been it might have been more on the other human services side of the coin. Um, so the first thing would be, has there been research done uh, that would actually put some data behind what we're arguing here that access to quality childcare is in fact an economic driver? It may not be the major one. I mean, water is a big one, but it may it's not an irrelevant one. Yeah, and that's a great point. There's actually a, a PAS memo that had directly correlated um, child care to economic growth and how for a sustainable solution uh, or how a sustainable solution can really affect the collective growth of a region. Um, and I thought that that was very important to include in my research and um, also including in my policy paper as well. I think that's important because, you know, in, in, there's one thing for us to sit here and talk about this today, but in the real world of politics, um, sometimes you have to show the hard edge you know, fact that yeah, you know, this isn't just a nice thing to do. It's everything we're saying is actually accurate. It has this, you know, it has this real measurable uh, economic dollars and cents benefit to a region. Absolutely, and that's something that Erie can um, explore and take advantage of. All of those benefits that I showed earlier of um, increased revenue for the state, um, increased economic growth, increased attractiveness to future um, employers that are looking to relocate uh, families, single people such as myself that moved up here in 2020, um, thinking about starting a family and how important some of those, um, it, that infrastructure is. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I think maybe a, a follow-up to this would be uh, to build at least a model of that four-cornered uh, idea that I was just talking about, that the way, because yeah, what, what we're talking about here is not uh, not designing a model for quality child care. There's a lot of literature and a lot of real world examples of what quality child care looks like. We're talking about building a model to make that accessible to uh, more and more people, which is actually, if you think about it on a minor level, an economic driver unto itself, it will create more high quality child care centers because there'll be more people able to afford it. So you get a virtual certain, not not a vicious cycle. You get a virtual, a virtuous cycle, that it reinforces itself. Got too many V's in that sentence for a moment. <laughs> well, and I I, th I think uh, what what I would pick up on and, and note is that made me think of uh, Tamara. You noted that in the Allegheny, Allegheny County example that there are some uh, 350 families being served, and yet there's a wait list. And and we know that the current system, uh, you know, be it looking at the data in Erie County or any any other place in America, the, the demand is clearly outweighing the supply in terms of what is available and how many families are waiting. And sometimes that forces uh, families, if there is a two-parent uh, household, to make the decision of, am I engaging in the workforce or am I raising my family? And then how may I re-engage the workforce at a point? Am I aged out of a workforce? What is what will it take to get me back to that? So, I, so I think that's the that's a clear important thing to remember in, in in your findings is that even as Allegheny County embarks on this pilot, we see that the the demand is still outweighing the supply. So we know solutions must come because otherwise, 
Uh, I would hate for us to be sitting here 10 years from now and having the same conversation saying, if only, if only, if only. Um, so so I'm, I'm sure that Dr. Roth may have other questions. Um, others might have things to think about. I, I, I would I would just say my, my last one, I, I would ask uh, Tamara before uh, we, we look to begin concluding this would be, you know, the very real next steps. What would you hope that, uh, you know, your colleagues from the JCLA who worked on childcare, um, you know, what, what might you hope that they're taking away from this and going and doing something? And then I think the, the resident perspective, you know, somebody in Erie County having heard this and said, this is a lot, and this seems like a wicked problem because no doubt it is, what can I be thinking about this afternoon as we head into it? And what do you hope people are still thinking about tomorrow morning? And then I think back to that advocacy question, what can we actually be doing? So what can a resident who's tuned into this, who may or may not have children, may be thinking about having children, but no doubt this impacts all of us as we all interact in the, you know, in the, 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 the ecosystem of our economy in Erie County. What is it that you're hoping we're doing today and tomorrow in the short term so we can set up those longer term, longer range solutions? I think the first step is becoming informed. Um, there's so much about childcare and even with this presentation that I gave today was just skimming the surface of, of what really could be investigated. So I think being informed is the most important part and really advocating um, to our local officials. I think there's more research that needs to be done um, within childcare and how we can address this issue specifically um, at a county level or even at a state level. And I think there are some um, different teams that are you know, working towards some of those solutions, but really for next steps, I think in terms of um, you know, learning about childcare is, is just <clears throat> getting to know what are the issues and really how that affects future growth for our, our region. Um, as far as, I guess, <clears throat> for the community, um, attending talks like this, I mean, once again, learning about childcare and learning about how it impacts um, our economy, so... And I, I, I think that the in, information is always key, Tamara, but I, I think you had an excellent point earlier in, in just surveying observational data, how many people know a family or are that family themselves experiencing this issue. And I think talking about it more often with more people more loudly draws this conversation out of the shadows and into the light and then we can pursue the path of information to find ourselves looking at what it is we can do about it uh, knowing the problem at hand better and then being able to respond accordingly uh, dr roth any concluding thoughts or questions that you have yeah, for our ramey fellow here those were good questions ben i think you know what the ramey fellows do is they draw attention to an issue they don't necessarily provide a solution to it that might be beyond um, beyond their commitment at this moment. And so it's like what the JCLA, the, the larger program did this year with their major topic on child care. And this is a subset of it showing two things that take away from Tamers, uh, not, to, not, to, not to beat on it too hard, but the economic development aspect of it that most people don't actually ever think about. And I think that has to be driven home. And then, you know, the two, so the two models from Allegheny County in New York. And the New York one's particularly interesting because it's a voucher program. And as I said earlier, there are uh, some enlightened employers in Erie County who do a version of that for their employees. Uh, and that is they don't run child care centers themselves. Uh, and I suspect the larger group that, that Court Gould is working with has run into this is that organizations uh, have discovered that trying to maintain a child care center within their own shop, so to speak, uh, brings a set of challenges is that, that perhaps they're not equipped to deal with. So this notion of voucher programs that are based also, though, on quality assessments. Uh, so I mean, the one program I'm somewhat aware of where uh, a, a major local employer gives vouchers uh, to their employees as an employee benefit that they can take and pay for child care, but it's only at certain child care centers that have been vetted by the employer uh, or by some other third party. 
So in any event, uh, I think a good a good next step would be besides a continuing the advocacy, just getting this issue out in front of people might be to look at what would uh, I don't know how many corners the model would have. I said three or four cornered one earlier, but looking at a model where you would have uh, a public private individual. Let me say it differently. Private entities, public entities and individuals creating some kind of uh, maybe three cornered way of subsidizing this so that families uh, across the economic spectrum, this isn't only uh, uh, aimed at um, uh, families who have reduced economic resources. This is across the board, it's an issue uh, so that they can get access to child better childcare, which therefore has, as we've said repeatedly throughout this, uh, both economic and social benefits uh, to uh, uh, to society, to the individual in society. Nice job, Tamar. Thank you, Dr. Roth. I appreciate it and uh, appreciate your help with the research to this point. Um, I think we have a great modelable solution for Erie County and um, let's see how we can make it happen. So echoing that gratitude and thanks uh, both to Dr. Andrew Roth, the director of the Ramey Fellowship Program, and, and to Tamar Fahmy, a Ramey Fellow. Uh, thank you for sharing this information, your research, having this conversation, uh, keeping these conversations moving and going. Folks, of course, thank you for tuning in, whether you are watching the live stream or you're accessing this event at a later date. You are a critical part of this conversation. To keep that conversation going and to find out about more work that the Jefferson Educational Society is doing, we invite you to head over to our website, jeserie.org. And of course, uh, like us on Facebook, connect with us on LinkedIn, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Thank you for joining today's conversation. Thank you, Tim.